Hello and welcome to Pathophysiology of Septic Shock. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Today we're going to be talking about septic shock, beginning with this whole process of inflammation and infection and how that ends up developing into sepsis, septic shock, and eventually into multi-organ dysfunction. So let's start out with this inflammatory process from the beginning here. So this is a diagram here on the left, and it's showing a splinter that has entered the skin in this patient. Well, there's three primary processes that are going to happen as a result of having any kind of trauma, injury, infection, etc. The response is always the same. Remember, inflammation is nonspecific. So it doesn't have a different response to injury than it does to infection. The response is the same. We have three things happen. We have vasodilation. So you see the picture on the right. You see that capillary has gotten very big there. We have capillary permeability. Now, we need to be able to get all of these substances, these cytokines, these neutrophils, we need to get all this stuff out there to the tissue so that it can fight off those pathogens and help to heal up that wound. In order to do that, we need to have that vasodilation first. Let's get more blood to the area. Capillary permeability. So the capillary becomes more permeable, and so all these things can get out. And then the third component is clotting. Well, hopefully we're going to have clotting so this patient doesn't bleed to death from that little splinter. In addition, we're also going to have an immune response. So this is showing the two different systems here in our immune response, the innate immune response over on the left-hand side, where we have our neutrophils, monocytes, etc., and they are working to help to keep us free from infection. Over on the right-hand side, we have the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is, as the name implies, adapting to infections that we come in contact with. So it develops these cells, T cells specifically, that are going to be able to identify an intruder when it comes into the body at some later point in time. Now, the immune system is secondary. It jumps in after that initial inflammatory response. So inflammation happens first, then we get the immune response. The immune response hopefully is going to be more targeted. So inflammation, general, happens very quickly. Immune response, a little bit slower, but it's more specific. It's going to be looking at one bacterium, virus, etc., that it's going to specifically be trying to target. So where does this infection come from, or where are some of the common sites of infection for sepsis? Uh, meningitis is one, okay, it's not the most common. Infection of an unknown source, so that could be a skin infection, it could be a variety of different types of infections. Pneumonia is a very common one, especially in the older population. Could be a bloodstream infection. Now, this would be the kind of thing that could happen with somebody who has a IV in place or a central line in place. Abdominal infections, including appendicitis, diarrhea, gallbladder infections, and those bacterium that, and fungi, etc., that cause diarrhea. Over on the left-hand side are skin and soft tissue infections. This is one way that people can become septic, is having an infection that comes in through the skin. So we have a break in the skin, and the skin didn't do its job in protecting the body from that bacterium or virus or fungus getting into the bloodstream, and now it's circulated out and got to the central circulation. Catheter-related and urinary tract. Urinary tract and pneumonia are two of our most common ones, especially in our older population. So now this infection, and this is showing the lungs here, so you know, the patient's got pneumonia. That infection has now gotten into the bloodstream, so we have bacteria entering the blood, and that bacteria is moving throughout the patient's body. Unfortunately, then, it's going to be moving out to other organs where it could be infecting other organs as well. In addition, when that bacterium gets into the bloodstream, it's going to be causing a generalized inflammatory response. So while that bacterium was just in the lung, it's causing a localized bacterial response or localized inflammatory response, and we're having all of those things you associate with pneumonia. So sputum production and difficulty breathing and all those other pieces, you know, changes on the x-ray, all that stuff is still lung-based, right? Now, once that bacteria or the virus gets into the bloodstream, now it's moving throughout the body and causing inflammation 
everywhere. This is what causes what we term sepsis. So, sepsis. On the left-hand side here, it's showing our primary injury or primary problem that's occurring in the patient's body. So there is something that's initiating this out-of-control inflammatory response. Three of the primary mediators are listed here. That's infection, injury, or ischemia. Now keep in mind that inflammation does not differentiate. So inflammation doesn't say, oh, it's infection, let's work this way, or oh, it's injury, let's work that. No, it's all the same kind of response. So whatever the initiating response is, the inflammation is the same, and we get that out of control inflammation. So let's just work with infection here since we're talking about sepsis. The patient has this pneumonia, and the bacterium got into the bloodstream like our previous slide showed. And now that bacterium is running throughout the body, throughout the bloodstream, causing inflammation everywhere. And this is what causes the thing we call septic shock. So we have inflammation going on throughout the body, a generalized inflammation. Remember the things that happen, vasodilation, capillary permeability, clotting. Vasodilation, if we have generalized vasodilation throughout the body, what's going to happen? The patient's going to end up in shock, right? If we have massive vasodilation throughout the body, we call this distributive shock. Capillary permeability. So it's not just a matter of having vasodilation and third spacing the fluid. It's also a matter of losing some of that fluid because we're having capillary permeability. And then we have clotting. So the third component then would be clotting. And clotting is going to, first of all, use up our platelets and our other clotting mechanisms, which could lead to the patient developing DIC. Now these situations, so this inflammation that's happening throughout the body, remember that bacteria is running around now and going everywhere, and that causes our secondary organ dysfunction. This is what we call multi-organ dysfunction syndrome, and our secondary injury to the body, our secondary organ dysfunction, starting with the lung. So, and again, you know, we're talking about a patient here who has pneumonia, so we'd expect that there would be the lung involved. But let's say that that infection came from a, an injury to the leg, a skin infection. The first place that bacterium is going to go and start causing problems is the lung. And the reason for that is it has a high surface area. There's lots of blood flow around the lung. And so that's one of the first places it attacks. Next is the kidney. Same process. Lots of blood flow. So the same kind of process. It's going to start to attack the kidney. Then the platelets in the hematologic system. So we're going to start using up those platelets and the patient could develop DIC. Then the liver, then the heart, then the brain. This is the multi-organ dysfunction that can occur as a result of sepsis leading to septic shock, leading to multi-organ dysfunction. So what we want to try to do with this is be identifying it over on the left-hand side here. Identify that infection, that injury, that ischemia, and be watching for those signs of inflammation. Vasodilation, capillary permeability, clotting. That way, hopefully, we can be on top of this and be treating it effectively so the patient doesn't end up in multi-organ dysfunction. If you're interested in learning more about critical care and critical care nursing, I would certainly would encourage you to check out our CCRN certification review. The content has been updated for the latest updates, which were 2020. It's an online facilitated course. So you get access to the instructor, me. You also get Q&A right within your course, timely updates to your questions, test-taking tips, and study strategies. Most of all, and most importantly, guaranteed that you will succeed and pass the CCRN. Want to know more? Go to thenursingprof.com. Thank you for joining me today for Pathophysiology of Septic Shock. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time, 